Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, Episode 569, The Treatment of Alcoholism with Psychologist Dr. Michael Mahan. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your host is Dr. Kathy Moffat, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging. Dr. Maupin is the author of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the award-winning book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of testosterone replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. Today we're going to talk about alcoholism and the treatment of alcoholism and how to um, bring a loved one or yourself uh, into treatment so that you do not have to be an alcoholic actively the rest of your life. Mike Mahan is our guest. He is Dr. Mike Mahan of Psych with Mike, and you can find him on where? On YouTube. Psychwithmike.com and on YouTube. Yes, on YouTube. Mike. So uh, where we are. So you can look up answers to any of your psychology questions or your situational problems, and it will probably be there. So today, um, I have some questions for Mike because in the last year and a half, uh, since we have had quarantine, many patients and many people um, that I know have become addicted to alcohol. And that is the, was the go-to when no one had anything to do, boredom, I guess, staying home, looking at the same four walls. So this has given me a new interest in um, diagnosing and treating or sending people for treatment for alcoholism. So last week we talked about the the problem. Mm -hmm. We talked about the medical illness, how to recognize it. And this week we are going to talk about the fa the parts of rehabilitation that I know nothing about mm -hmm. and Mike's an expert on and how that works and how you can help your loved ones with this problem. So my, uh, my first question is, and it's it goes back to last week a little bit, mm -hmm. is um, once you are once you have somehow convinced the person who's an alcoholic mm -hmm. that they do have a problem, which is no easy feat, then how? what is the next step? What, what do you recommend that me as a doctor or a loved one of um, an alcoholic should do next? Should they get them into counseling? Should they take them to rehab mm -hmm. right away? What is the, what's the best method or the best process? Well... As we had discussed last week, the idea of motivational interviewing is now the best practice, considered mm -hmm. the best practice for the treatment of substance use disorders. And that is based on the Porsche de Clemente uh, work on stages of change. And so that's approaching the individual from where they are. Mm -hmm. And so if I were going to give somebody advice about talking to a person who has decided that they have an issue, I would want to understand where they are. So 12-step recovery programs work really, really well for some people. But even by the APA, so the American Psychological Association's own estimation in the monitor, which is the APA's magazine, they report that about 65% of people, 65 to 70% of people who identify as recovering have never attended a 12-step meeting. So that isn't the only way mm -hmm. to get into recovery. So counseling, some other form of institutionalized therapy, there are other programs like Celebrate Recovery and things like that that are religious based. So I want to understand where this person is. So I want to talk to them about have you ever thought about going mm -hmm. to a 12-step program? Have you ever thought about going to AA meetings? And if they're open to that, then I would recommend that. Mm -hmm. If they're not open to that, I would recommend that they go into counseling and do some individualized counseling mm -hmm. to help them understand what would be something that they might feel that they could wrap their head around mm -hmm. to try and treat their disorder. But I want to do that from the perspective of where that person is. 
Okay, that's good advice. So I would probably, as a physician, I would pro- once I had somebody who was actually asking mm-hmm. me, what do I do now? I would probably send them to a psychologist mm-hmm. counselor to to then discern yes. what stage my patient was in and then how to proceed. Right. I think that is great advice. So, And that would be right for a family member as well. Mm-hmm. So. Um, One of the um, problems that I have with my patients who are go through rehab mm-hmm. and come out is that they are now addicted to sugar. Mm-hmm. And I don't. I kind of understand that process because mm-hmm. alcohol takes the place of sugar. People, some some alcoholics don't eat very much, and so the alcohol then becomes the source of energy for the cells. Mm-hmm. How do you counter that? How what do you do to to so that they don't gain fifty pounds, mm-hmm. you know, immediately because that's very depressing mm-hmm. and may cause them to relapse. The thing that people may not recognize is that this whole mechanism of action, so mechanism of action is how something works mm-hmm. in the body, is based on the neurotransmitter dopamine. Mm-hmm. And so dopamine in the reward pathways of the brain is what causes us to become addicted in the first place. And it's what can help us to be able to overcome that addiction. So Mm -hmm. sugar, there's a lot of sugar in alcohol. People do become addicted to sugar, Mm -hmm. but they're using that sugar in a way that is also giving them extra dopamine in that reward pathway. And so what I tell people is you can train yourself to get shots of dopamine other ways that Mm -hmm. are good for you. Mm -hmm. So exercise Mm -hmm. is a way of getting dopamine, Mm -hmm. and we all know that. And you Mm -hmm. can train yourself to really get into exercise, or you can find a hobby. If you've never played golf, you can play golf. Mm -hmm. And what you then want to do is you don't want to go and condemn yourself. Whatever this activity is or whatever that you're picking Mm -hmm. to try and replace how you're getting that dopamine, you don't want to make that a negative thing. So you don't want to go play golf and tell yourself what a horrible golfer you are. And you want to really concentrate. Anybody who plays golf, anybody who's ever played golf knows (laughs) if you swing a club a hundred times, one of those shots is going to be good. Yeah. And it will, but it, and and that's (laughs) what's difficult Mm -hmm. for people who play golf is, is trying to remain focused Mm -hmm. on that one good shot because we all want to pay attention to the 99 bad shots. But if you're Mm -hmm. going to replace this dopamine Mm -hmm. charge that you get, then you can't make it a negative. It has to be a positive and you want to build on that. So whatever that is Mm -hmm. that you pick, pick something that's good for you and then really use that and give yourself positive feedback for that, that can help replace that dopamine that you're missing because mm-hmm. you're not doing the alcohol anymore. So let me interject that dopamine is the feel-good hormone. Mm-hmm. And we all have dopamine, and the stimulation for our dopamine is different from for different people. And it's partially genetic. It's partially how we've learned mm-hmm. to um, make ourselves happy. I mean, sometimes dopamine is from a relationship or a mm-hmm. friendship. Um, and dopamine is what is missing in Parkinson's. When dopamine is, is not produced, then you get the mm-hmm. jitters and so and you get the tremor. And right. that's very similar to what happens when people are withdrawing from alcohol. Mm-hmm. As they're d- withdrawing, their dopamine falls because their source of stimulation for the dopamine has to be replaced with something right. or they're going to have the, these tremors. Right. I, I, I use... Um, methyl B12 shot mm-hmm. injections mm-hmm. often because that does help the dopamine pathway mm-hmm. and it also helps the uh, helps the tremor. But so. we have to be clear that that L-dopa, which is a dopamine precursor mm-hmm. that's used in Parkinson, mm-hmm. has not been shown to be clinically effective with yes. things like alcohol withdrawal and things like that. Right. So we can't just give people L-dopa because mm-hmm. people say, "Oh, well, if it's like mm-hmm. Parkinson's, we should just give them L-dopa." That no, hasn't no, been that's, shown. No, no, I didn't mean to. Yeah. Uh, to, but that. I've had people say that to me. Mm-hmm. And well, it makes kind of makes sense. It does make sense. But it doesn't work like right. that. Dopamine um, and L-dopa comes basically is on a continuum from um, norepinephrine is then in a pathway to make L-dopa and, and dopamine. 
So some people who have like adrenal failure don't have enough, um, don't have enough norepinephrine. Mm -hmm. If you don't have enough norepinephrine, you can't make enough dopamine, so then you're depressed. So right. oftentimes we use antidepressants that stimulate norepinephrine. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, that can cause you to have anxiety. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we have to be very careful with those medications. In some cases, exercise is mm -hmm. going to give you dopamine through the, uh, the um, norepinephrine pathway. Mm -hmm. So you're going to increase norepinephrine, psh, you're going to make more dopamine. Mm -hmm. So that's how it works. And it works better through the norepinephrine pathway than it does by giving mm -hmm. do dopamine. So there's something about that process of making norepinephrine into dopamine that actually is necessary. You mm -hmm. can't just give the dopamine. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, we still have not found a drug mm -hmm. that will replace the craving for alcohol. And I don't know why that is. You would think that we would be smart enough to figure mm -hmm. that out. But we haven't. The, the drugs we use are basically to help people not die while they go through withdrawal. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's a life-saving mm -hmm. me uh, mechanism and not, and not just trying to fix the alcoholism. They, they just haven't figured mm -hmm. that out. But your there advice are, about hobbies is really yeah, good. Uh, there are a couple of medications that have been used, naltrexone and Camperol. Um, whether or not those things are more effective than not taking them, the mm -hmm. research on that is uh, a, a little bit controversial or, or inconclusive. Um, but it's better than, so in the old days, we used to give people an abuse, mm -hmm. which would just make you really, really sick mm -hmm. if you drank, but you could just not take your an abuse that day and then drink. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really, really ineffective. So these newer drugs mm -hmm. are better than the old way of doing things, but you're absolutely right. We haven't found anything that we can say, oh, we can give somebody this medication and we know that that's going to be helpful for them. That's that's true, and we sh and I'm sure that there's a million labs working on that, but but we haven't found it. Mm -hmm. um, my advice, and it may not be, it, it always has worked. My advice to patients is to try to not follow their sugar mm -hmm. cravings, but to use a high protein diet like protein shakes mm -hmm. to try to make ketones, which mm -hmm. then give mm -hmm. them the same kind of feeling, which gives you el more elation, helps your mood. And uh, so a ketotic diet is usually better than um, crumpling in and eating all the sugar you can eat. Because mm -hmm. that's usually the answer for people to replace, to replace, mm -hmm. or alcoholics to replace their alcohol. So I think in, in the past that's worked. I don't mm -hmm. know if you have any experience with that or not. But. Well, I, I, absolutely. I, I, I agree 100% that, that people consume sugar they get a spike right mm -hmm. in their in their blood sugars and then they get a drop mm -hmm. and then they usually feel worse mm -hmm. which makes them want to eat more sugar mm -hmm. whereas the ketone diet is much more longer in duration so it takes longer to actually metabolize mm -hmm. those m molecules and what I think is also beneficial from that is if you're eating a high protein diet and you are exercising, you're probably going to lose some weight. Mm -hmm. You're probably going to feel better. You're going to look better in your clothes. That's going to then also be reaffirming. For me, it's as much about socially how you feel about yourself mm -hmm. as it is anything else. And that's really the trick is if you've been somebody who's been chemically dependent for a long period of time. Mm -hmm you've probably done some damage to your life, mm -hmm. to your relationships, mm -hmm. maybe even socially with your friends, and you may have to repair some of that. The better that you feel about yourself, the more likely it is that you're gonna do that. If all you're doing is tearing yourself down, that's just digging yourself a deeper hole. What, <laughs> I, I keep going back to, what do you do with people that you know have just com completely destroyed their lives, but their spouse or their significant mm -hmm. other is, is just going along with it, mm -hmm. and um, but they're going to kill themselves. Mm -hmm. Is there any? I mean, is there anything a friend can do to help? I mean, people who pass out at dinner and you know crack their skull open. And, mm -hmm. I mean, that, things like that that are obvious. It's not just oh you're drinking too much or you're loud. Mm -hmm. It's I mean, it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. Is there any any kind of intervention that can be done by anybody else, or does it have to be by intimate partners? 
Well, I, it, it may not even be able to be done by intimate partners. It may just be that the individual is hell bent on self destruction. Okay. And what I tell other members of that family unit is you don't have control over that. And the only thing you have control over is whether or not you stick around to witness it. But mm -hmm. until the individual decides that they're going to change, there isn't going to be change. But at the same time, I'm pretty upfront and I tell people, I don't like the way this is going. Mm -hmm. I think that you are on a path of self-destruction and that this is going to end badly. And that's just my opinion, but mm -hmm. I've had a lot of experience in this, but again, people are in denial. And so they're going mm -hmm. to say, no, that's not me. I'm different. I'm unique mm -hmm. and you don't know anything about me. And there's nothing that I can do. There's nothing that a spouse can do. There's nothing that a friend can do to try and change that individual's thought process until they decide that they're going to change it for themselves. Okay. That makes sense. And then you can't, you just can't worry about it after you've done your, no. after you said your piece, then you can't worry about it. But oftentimes I find with friends, people just laugh it off. Mm -hmm. And that isn't, that's positive reinforcement for them drinking more. Mm -hmm. And that is, the, not the proper response, although being a complete, you know, like, this is terrible, you know, and, and judgmental is not a good answer either. Mm -hmm. But doing what you said, you know, I care about you. I want you to be healthy. And mm -hmm. I'm worried about I'm worried about you that you're going to you're going to hurt yourself next time or you're, God forbid you get in a car. Mm -hmm. The people that I know that do this don't drive when they're drinking. So, well, that's there. good. Yeah, but, but But why don't they? Because they have some insight that is telling them that this behavior is inappropriate. Mm -hmm. And at least they have enough insight to not get in a motor vehicle. But mm -hmm. anybody who says, oh, I think I drink too much to drive more than five times in their lives, mm -hmm. probably ought to think about that. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's true. And so if anybody's listening <laughs> who has that kind of issue that that's your trigger point five times in your life well and what whether i mean i'm saying you know if it's five times in six months that's obvious mm -hmm. not good no. if it's five times over the course of 50 years even that's mm -hmm. not good but i can remember we talked last time about uh you know when i was younger i was chemically dependent and i used to tell people all the time if you can't walk you have to drive Yeah, and and, and that, how that crazy make, is that? That would make sense only to somebody who's exactly. But and but I'm not yeah. joking, Kathy. When I said that, uh -huh. that made sense to me. Well, I, I'm too drunk to walk. <laughs> of course, I have to drive. Oh my god! Of course, you wouldn't ask someone to drive you home. No. Oh, <laughs> then you'd heaven have to forbid! It. No, that would be a sign of weakness. I couldn't possibly do that. <laughs> and and I think of the times that I operated a motor vehicle when I was intoxicated and only by the grace of God did nothing happen where I killed either somebody in the car I was driving or someone else. But I've worked with people who that has happened to. And I can tell you in my experience, nobody ever gets over that. Yeah. I used, I, when my daughter was an adolescent, I used to say that before she'd go out at, on dates with her friends, mm -hmm. whatever I'd say, what are the four things that will ne that you can never fix that mm -hmm. will change your life forever? One is a DWI mm -hmm. because it does. You can't get into medical school. I don't know if you can get into law school. I think maybe you can, but a DWI is is deadly in, in the job market uh, because that says something mm -hmm. about you. Um, killing someone with your vehicle will mm -hmm. send you to jail. So that's another one, getting pregnant before you want to get pregnant mm -hmm. and getting arrested for drugs or alcohol. Mm -hmm. I say, okay. She say, da, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. But then at the end of high school, she said, oh, by the way, I'm the only one that I know. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say this, that didn't have one of those. Mm -hmm. And I'm like. <sighs> one of those four things. And mm -hmm. that's, that's huge. Mm -hmm. But I mean, she thought I would, I mean. Of course, I was not the most popular mother because <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm always, I, I'm always, I was always, you know, just tell me again, remember those things. And, and it was in the back of her head. Mm -hmm. And even though she thought I was nerdy, mm -hmm. it didn't matter. I didn't care mm -hmm. because I was supposed to be her mother first and her friend second. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, okay. So to, to kind of wrap up this mm -hmm. series, 
I know that a lot of people are afraid. They know they've got a problem. Mm -hmm. They're afraid what's going to happen in rehab. They mm -hmm. don't know what's going to happen. It's an unknown. It's like jumping off a cliff and not knowing if there's, there's somebody there to catch you. So I'd like for you to tell us kind of what that, it, what that involves mm -hmm. when you go into rehab, what, what happens to you. And then we'll go over some, just some of the, uh, I have a, I have a um, table of some mm -hmm. of the medications they use. If you've, you're currently drinking and you go in, if you have been haven't been drinking for 24 hours and then longer than that. So, mm -hmm. um, so please tell everybody and me what exactly happens when you, in general, when you go into rehab. So rehab obviously has evolved also, and part of that is um, because of insurance. But when I first started in behavioral health, back in the late 70s, early 80s, we could put somebody in rehab for 90 days. And okay. that was routine. And you would go through that treatment in a hospital mm -hmm. setting, and your family would be involved for a lot of that mm -hmm. time. And then, you know, rehab went to 30 days, and now, you know, basically you get time in the hospital for medically assisted mm -hmm. detoxification. Mm -hmm. You don't really get to stay in the hospital mm -hmm. for a full blown 30 day treatment paradigm. Now, people say, is there anything that is somehow magical about that 30 days? And the answer is no. Mm -hmm. uh, that was just you know what the hospitals at the time said. If we can get this person out of their environment for 30 days, mm -hmm. they can lear learn new behavior. Mm -hmm. And that's true, but the, mm -hmm. you have to go back to your old life. So the what happens in treatment is that an individual gets introduced to the possibility that they could make different choices and gets introduced to coping strategies that they could use to help them to remain sober long term. Mm -hmm. But that's all. And then the person has to actually implement those things. Mm -hmm. So what's really important isn't what happens to you in treatment. Mm -hmm. It's what happens to you when you leave treatment. And so a person needs to be in long-term outpatient therapy, whether that is with the treatment facility mm -hmm. or in a private kind of therapy practice mm -hmm. where they can practice these new coping strategies and be able to evaluate that in real time because that's where the rubber hits the road, it meets the road, is when you leave the treatment mm -hmm. center, being able to employ those new coping strategies mm -hmm. and being able to do that consistently. And that's really important. And mm -hmm. that kind of comes into, I mean, a lot of people, I think everybody needs a um, counselor, psychologist, a doctor, and a lawyer. I mean, mm -hmm. pretty much mm -hmm. every every human needs that, especially if you didn't grow up in a perfect household, and no one did, mm -hmm. because parents aren't taught how to be parents, and it's always trial and error. But this, having issues, I used, I used to always ask um Brett Newcomb, I always say, okay, so this is the situation. I don't know what to say or do, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So that's basically what they're saying. Okay, I had this situation. Mm -hmm. I'm in this situation, and now I don't know what to do next. Right. And so that's that's one of the benefits of counseling because you can make your wrong decision or you can ask somebody how to do it right, mm -hmm. who, who has the training and the experience to tell you how to do it mm -hmm. right. And then you can be successful. Uh, part of... I think the fear of, of rehab, it, it's kind of like when I tell people they can never have another sugared mm -hmm. soda. Mm -hmm. There are some people who have, you know, 10 of these a day and they don't understand why they're fat. Mm -hmm. Well, if we took that away, you probably wouldn't be fat. Mm -hmm. So when I tell them that, they're crying because they've just lost their best friend. Mm -hmm. I mean, sugar can be addictive too. Mm -hmm. So, um, So in this way, you know, when you're facing taking away your best friend, you've got to find another best friend. That's right. And so you have to find something else that you are, you love, mm -hmm. or somebody you love, or some activity you right. love to actually take right. its place. Nature abhors a vacuum. If you take alcohol or any drug out of a person's life mm -hmm. that they've been dependent on, something else is going to fill that void. Either they're going to choose what that is, mm -hmm. or nature is going to choose it, mm -hmm. and it would be better for them to choose. Right. So. Many of the many of the um, addictions, and you can tell me if I'm wrong. I have always believed were a lack of a neurotransmitter, 
meaning ADD didn't have enough mm-hmm. norepinephrine, mm-hmm. and uh, depression didn't mm-hmm. have enough serotonin mm-hmm. and dopamine. Mm-hmm. And many addictions, mm-hmm. I believe a lot of ADDers use cocaine because mm-hmm. it's, a, it's mm-hmm. similar. Mm-hmm. A, lot of, a lot of ADDers, uh, different types of ADDers, the AD, uh, ADD but not ADHDs, use marijuana, mm-hmm. and that kind of makes them more focused. You know, so there's a lot of things. If we had a medication for mm-hmm. it that was as good as the addiction, mm-hmm. then it would be a good answer mm-hmm. because that, that would allow people to live their lives and not ruin their lives mm-hmm. through this particular right. addiction. Yeah, that's right. And that's why when we were talking last week, you know, I had said that in the beginning, almost always, there appears to be some significant success with the use of a drug before it becomes dependent, before the individual becomes dependent on it for exactly that reason. They're self medicating, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So, and, and we know it's genetic. So, genetics plus self medicating mm-hmm. your. Um, deficient neurotransmitters. I mean, there are other ways to do that, Mm -hmm. and you've described them. But then it doesn't seem like such a personal problem, because it Mm -hmm. really isn't. It's really a medical problem. It's really a genetic problem, Mm -hmm. and and it becomes a social and psychological problem. But that's something that you have to get through to people Mm -hmm. so that they don't feel like guilty, Mm -hmm. and that just makes them drink again, because that's that's not healthy for them and i also think that it's harder right it's harder to take responsibility for it and to do the things consistently that you choose to do rather it's easy to take a drug Mm -hmm. it's easier to do that it's harder to do those other Mm -hmm. intentional things and that's something that people have to come to terms with am i willing to choose to do this other thing that's harder, mm-hmm. even though I know it would be better for me, that's that's a difficult thing yeah, for people to is. choose. It is, because we usually choose the easiest right. way. And that's kind of human nature, mm-hmm. so we have to go against human nature. The last thing I, I wanted to go through mm-hmm. was the, um, the withdrawal process, either withdrawal that's acute, which is if you've been drinking alcohol that day and you go in for treatment, that's called acute. The subacute, which is if you drank yesterday and you come in for treatment, and then the not acute, which is you haven't drunk for two days and you go in for treatment. So in the um, in the acute stage, um, we don't use uh, benzodiazepines are like Valium, Xanax. We don't use Valium or Xanax when we are treating somebody in medical uh, withdrawal. We do use IV fluids and Ativan. And um, that helps with tremors, which are very disturbing as people are, are mm-hmm. uh, going, through, going through rehab. Um, some of the, I'll, I'll show in the next, in the next table, uh, some of the other um, supplements and uh, diets that can be used for these different, um, these different categories of withdrawal. But if you look at subacute, if, if you were drinking yesterday, you go into rehab, then they'll use Librium, which I remember using on everyone, mm-hmm. and then they'll taper it, and that's oral, three times a day, down to twice a day, down to one at one time a day, as you are withdrawing. They don't usually need IV fluids, but sometimes they do. Um, and in the non-acute, that can all be done orally. You don't need IV fluids, but mm-hmm. you still should be watched. That's no drinking for two days or more before you come into rehab, and that's used, we use Ativan for that, one to two milligrams. So that's used for every 46 hours, and that's a lengthier uh, treatment. It, it, usually they take the out-of-van home with them. Mm-hmm. Um, so in the next, in the next table, uh, I've added to some of the recommendations that are given by the American Family um, Practice Physicians and Family Medicine, sorry, physicians. Um, everybody should be taking a multivitamin because alcohol – strips you Mm -hmm. of all of your vitamins, you have nothing left, and you need to be taking uh, multivitamins in the the acute stage, we give them to you IV. Mm -hmm. Um, You have to be taking folate, because folate is necessary for every cell to divide, and it's necessary for you to be healthy, and and alcohol wipes it out. Mm. Thiamine is also necessary, it's a B vitamin, and it should be given IV during the acute process. And I added B12, because B12 is also 
completely stripped mm -hmm. when you're you have alcoholism. So you have to get IM or shots of B12 for the first four weeks, and you can even get they can even give it sub Q so you get more of it faster. Um, Diet for the first day, mm -hmm. you don't, they don't feed you anything during the first day of treatment. Mm -hmm. But as you get better, they start treating you. And um, because you're, because during the first day, you don't... Pretty nauseous. Yeah, they usually don't yeah, want to eat. You don't want to eat. Mm -hmm. we, we don't give you any supplements at that time. But as you go through from acute to subacute, then we still use the vitamins. We still use folate, thiamine, and B, and B12. But we put you on a low-carb, high-protein diet or a ketotic diet, the, the um, low-carb ketotic diets, there's several of them, but they all essentially work. But we don't have you take simple sugars, mm -hmm. like candy, mm -hmm. cookies, cake, that would none spike of that. Your... that. That would spike your blood sugar mm -hmm. and make you, it make you feel hypoglycemic, and then you would start craving alcohol. And so mm -hmm. that would prevent you from being able to stay off of it. Uh, the supplements that I like after you start having things orally, NAD is a, is a um, supplement that actually helps people who have addictions. And anybody who has been diagnosed as an alcoholic should probably take that the rest of their lives. It helps with the craving part. Um, milk thistle is a, an herb or a, it's a, yeah, it's an herb. And, and it cleans your liver and your liver definitely mm. needs to be cleaned out. So milk thistle is important. Probiotics and prebiotics are important because your gut has just been completely stripped of any of the good bacteria, all the bad bacteria mm -hmm. there, and now you need to give it good bacteria so you can make neurotransmitters. Mm -hmm. You're not going to make your own dopamine or your own uh, uh, serotonin or norepinephrine mm -hmm. until you've got gut bacteria there. So you've got to take probiotics and prebiotics. Uh, so that's very important. Vitamin D is important for every cell in your body, and no one in above Florida in the United States gets enough vitamin D. So mm -hmm. you should take 5,000 units of vitamin D orally a day. Um, methyl B12, um, you can take that sublingually, 5,000 units under the tongue or, or uh, chewable. And NAC, N-acetylcysteine, uh, two a day, that helps clear your liver too. So that's a nice protocol that mm -hmm. I've I've put together based on what you need physiologically to get past this. There are other things you could take. You could take magnesium and some other mm -hmm. things, but, but these are the essentials. And then for not acute, that is also essential. Basically, um, it's exactly the same thing, but you'll just keep taking it on. Mm -hmm. When um, we tr are able to treat both the physical and the psychological, mm -hmm and put people on a path to healthier living, which is, is what I do at BioBalance is not just hormones. I mean, we, we treat hormones, but if I see another problem, then I have mm -hmm. to treat that as well, or I have to send to an expert. So sometimes I have to say to a patient, this is not my field. It may be, I mean, I've had some very unusual illnesses that I've found that the patient didn't know that they had, and we find the experts to send them to. And in this case, we would send them to a psychologist or mm -hmm. a counselor who specializes in addictions. And that would be your first step. And that mm -hmm. would be what I would tell somebody. I probably would put them on the supplements to begin mm -hmm. with to give them a beginning for this, even if they hadn't been withdrawn from the alcohol, just to give them a head start. Mm -hmm. um, and that could actually be really important. I mean, it might be just enough to allow them to be able to make the decision to try mm -hmm. and abstain. Yeah, absolutely. Your thinking is fuzzy. Mm -hmm. When you don't have any of these nutrients and you're living off of alcohol in your cells instead of sugar or instead of blood sugar, mm -hmm. you don't think co correctly. Well, your personality isn't the, the same. The probiotics and the prebiotics make so much sense to me. We've always known that if you're putting a neurotransmitter into your body artificially, like taking a drug, mm -hmm. that your body's not going to make it itself. I didn't realize mm -hmm. that's the process that mm -hmm. was going on, but that makes all the sense in the world. It's not really us. It's the bacteria yeah. in our gut that that's makes right. all of that. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't put the right bacteria in, then the bad bacteria overwhelm mm -hmm. it and kill off the good. And then your gut's not healthy, but you also, your brain isn't either. Whoever knew that you could get to the heart, get to, to the heart, which is our brain mm -hmm. through the gut, mm -hmm. but you know, that's what grandma told us. <laughs>
Thank you so much. I've oh, learned so thank much. Thank you for and having I, me. I hope that um, our listeners have learned a lot about this issue and that this helps them change their own life or someone else's life and keeps them safe from withdrawing by themselves and keeps them uh, gives them the best chance of living a healthy life. Thank you for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth.